And good morning, everybody. I'm John O'Loughlin, and I and the Ospreys welcome you to uh, McDuff Lives 2, or McDuff Lives 2. And this is our uh, main channel right now. I'd like you to start thinking of it as the main channel, because I'm really not going to risk doing anything on McDuff Lives right now, because there's only, there's something, three or 400 videos on there that are right on the edge of getting swept away one more strike and we are out of there so sometime in the middle of december one of the strikes disappears so we may go back there because there's seven thousand people over there but there's a good news there's one thousand people here we have hit the one thousand subscriber mark and uh thanks for spreading the word with your friends and neighbors keep in touch with us at screamingospreys.com where you can not only see uh, our beautiful Osprey cam uh, provided to us by Jumping Mouse and all the other great web manipulations she does for us. She built our calendar, which is at the bottom of the page. And she built us a chat room, which we haven't used much yet. I'm going to start doing live shows directly on the website. And when we do that, we'll need that chat room. Because I think the chat is one of the most essential and important parts of our show. And you guys come up with some great ideas and you think together while we're reading. And um, it's a bit of multitasking that I can, I can approve, appreciate and approve of. I'm going to have a little ginger tea. I got a bit of a frog in my throat this morning. Amazing how many people are just leaving YouTube. Um, and and I, I probably will try to stay here just because of the amazing reach that YouTube has. You know, I resent the censorship. But if I can reach, you know, thousands of people, that is very important to me. If I am only reaching a couple hundred people, then even though... I might have free speech. I'm not reaching as many people. So it's a trade-off right now. I'm interested in Rumble, where Andy and Neighborhood News Studio have parked themselves. Um, I, I'm wondering if they've just run right out of, of YouTube. I'll be seeing Andy. Andy and I are going to have a uh, a live show Thursday night here on McDuff Lives 2. So Andy Dibala of Neighborhood News Studio will be joining me live. And uh, I have been so busy, I haven't been able to catch up with him. So we're gonna, we're gonna catch up with each other on Thursday night, right here on McDuff Lives 2. Well, it's interesting out in West Virginia, which, you know, in the colonial era was all just part of Virginia. There is a Swiss town uh, with Swiss architecture and Swiss traditions and, and speaking Swiss Schweizerdeutsch. Um, Arrest of Klaus? <laughs> I don't. I couldn't. I couldn't imagine that. No. No. I think Klaus has probably got tons of protection. Excuse me. Sorry. Of course, I can think of a million reasons he should be arrested. You know, tomorrow I'll have Harley Schlanger back here at 11 o'clock a.m. So remember to mark your calendars for tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. I think the Schiller Institute is starting to really start to feel what we're feeling. They got they got a, a strike, a YouTube strike. The Schiller people did. 
you know, now, now those guys are like straight shooting as, as you can imagine. And as I get to know them, I realize they're extremely smart people. And they've been working on a lot of their projects for a long, long time. But I think that this whole mRNA thing has not really hit their radar screen yet. And how different this thing is from a traditional, you know what I mean. Now, on this channel, we got a uh, our first um, strike, which was a warning. So we didn't lose any time yet. But the next one will be a week. And so I didn't say the V word. Yeah. So that we were just talking about um, the Swiss, and you remember this? There was a Swiss geologist that was coming out to the Spotswood mine in Germana to lead the German settlers in creating an iron mine, and it's a uh, so fascinating to see how the Swiss are are well. Of course, they live in the mountains, so they would have the expertise, but also the money to come out and invest in a venture like that. Where does that come from? Well, I'm sure Sean Ross would have a good answer for us over at Jewelry channel on YouTube. He's all about Swissy. And I enjoy Sean Ross's, he does beautiful, beautiful work. His, his videography is quite good. And you get to see all of these Templar and, you know, creepy places. It's a great, uh, great show. Jure, G-I-U-R-E-H on, uh, on YouTube. Okay. Well, in this case, the Swiss lost their chance to um, establish a Swiss-run colony in Western Virginia. I'm sure that a proposal will not die, but uh, so the defeat of that plan may well have involved some private collaboration between Fairfax and Spotswood, with Keith taking the public role. But Fairfax is the is is the proprietor of the Northern Neck, where this land is located. Um, Spotswood is the sometimes governor of Virginia, and Keith is the sometimes governor of New York. So, Spotswood certainly aided Fairfax in Virginia during 1735 to 37 in confirming the maximum extent of the Northern Neck proprietary. Keith dedicated his 1738 map of Virginia published in his history of the colony to the Right Honorable Thomas Lord Fairfax and provided a glowing account of Spotswood's governorship as well. Interesting, isn't it? Keith, 1738 map. In any case, Lord Fairfax now began publicly to assert his proprietary interests with particular attention to the dispute over his western land claims. King Carter's terms as agent and lessee of the Northern Neck expired in 1732. Fortunately, Carter himself expired shortly thereafter. To his derisive nickname, a popular ditty soon added an epitaph. Here lies Robin, but not Robin Hood. Here lies Robin that never was good. Here lies Robin that God has forsaken. Here lies Robin the devil has taken. Not bad for 1732, huh? I wish I'd interview him too. I, I don't know how to really uh, engender that to happen. I, I will if, if anybody knows him well enough. Uh, we're talking about Sean Ross. I'd love to talk to him, absolutely. You know, it's it's one of the things when you start doing these, these uh, uh, shows is there's all kinds of people that you'd like to interview, but you're not on their radar screen and they don't have time to check you out. 
So what, that's why agents are involved in these things sometimes. And I'm just, uh, I've got plenty of content and a lot of stuff on my mind that I haven't been able to say yet. And I've been doing it for four some years now. So we're going to keep on uh, going. But gosh, if anybody wants to say, hey, Sean Ross, you should you should check out John O'Loughlin, you know, maybe he will. Oh, my. I'm sorry, guys. My throat's just a little sore. I might might not make it too long. Largely through robbing the Fairfax proprietary, Carter had amassed rough, roughly 300,000 acres of land in Virginia. At the time of his death, he held 10,000 pounds in cash and 1,000 slaves. Isn't that amazing? Not counting the booty already distributed to other members of his family. Lord Fairfax prevented further looting by Carter's heirs by suspending issue of any new grants in the Northern Neck. He also petitioned the King's Privy Council as peer of the realm, requesting an official survey to, quote, settle the marks and boundaries of his proprietary claim. After consulting the Board of Trade, the Privy Council issued an order that the issue be settled by survey to be jointly conducted by representatives of Lord Fairfax and the Colony of Virginia. Fairfax now moved to ensure that he would have a loyal agent in Virginia to represent the proprietary. There are intriguing circumstances surrounding this aspect of the story as well. William Fairfax, the proprietor's first cousin and close friend, had seen duty in the Army, Navy, and Colonial Service under Queen Anne. His career in public life ended temporarily in 1717 after George I, George I had taken power in Britain. In 1725, William Fairfax was appointed collector of His Majesty's Customs, for the ports of Salem and Marblehead, Massachusetts. Following his wife's death in 1731, he married a 23-year-old widow, Deborah Clark, whose former husband's family included a prominent Salem minister, well known to Cotton Mather. In 1734, Lord Fairfax persuaded his cousin William to become his agent for the Northern Neck. Brian Fairfax, Lord Thomas's former guardian, was one of George II's commissioners of the customs at that time. He arranged to have William reassigned as collector of customs for the South Potomac District, the settled portion of the Northern Neck proprietary. The strategic potential of the Fairfax Grant was finally in friendly hands. Quote, Robin Walpole apparently preferred to gamble against a member of the House of Lords rather than confront Spotswood's forces directly. Politically, Lord Fairfax was also a British domestic consideration. Within his county of Kent, he had used his influence against Walpole's party for years. Whatever calculations Walpole may have made, he soon found that Spotswood still had the upper hand in Virginia. The Fairfaxes had also hidden their first move. When William Fairfax arrived in the Northern Neck, his appointment as proprietary agent was still a secret. To official knowledge, he was simply the new customs collector for the South Potomac, reporting to Commissioner Brian Fairfax in London. His undercover assignment was to gather political intelligence concerning the Fairfax grant, which posed the difficulty of making, quote, proper inquiries without giving suspicion. Beyond discovering exorbitant extent, the exorbitant extent of Carter's defrauding the proprietary, William Fairfax learned that vast tracts of land toward the first springs of Potomac were being granted by agents of Pennsylvania. He urged, quote, a scrutiny and search after the utmost limits, quote, of the Fairfax claim. Lord Fairfax sailed for Virginia in March 1735, arriving in May to set foot in the northern neck for the first time. During that rainy spring and summer, he stayed with his cousin William's family at a rented house in Westmoreland County, near the broad stretches of the Potomac approaching Chesapeake Bay. In other words, right across the river from me right now. I mean, I could, uh, I could probably look at the land that he stayed at. 
the location was just above the Washington family's northern neck plantation, which was situated along the river near Pope's Creek. Pope's Creek. There's a man named Pope. Pope. There was brothers. There was a whole family of people named Pope, and they were Catholics. And then there came the Masons. And this is one of my, this is my pet theory, okay? I, I think you'll like it. My pet theory is that the Jesuits set up a system whereby the Freemasons would flourish on the Virginia side of the Potomac and the Jesuits on the Maryland side. Now, this settler pope had land on both, or maybe it's two popes of, related to each other, but there's a Pope's Creek on both sides of the, of the Potomac. And this fellow pope, you know, is connected with the land in the District of Columbia that, that um, part of it, you know, was Daniel Carroll's, but also part of it um, pertains to this pope family. And I haven't completed my research into that, but I wanted to mention it to you because if you can imagine, as the settlements grew from the uh, the, the the bottom or the, the southern part of the Potomac River going up, you also are growing a free a bound a Freemasonry connection going all the way up the Potomac to Georgetown on one side and the Catholics on the Maryland side. And I think that parallels this story we've been studying in Rulers of Evil about the hidden hand behind both the Society of Jesus and the Freemasonry, i.e. the Black Pope. Interesting, isn't it? Hey, thanks, Patacorn. That's that's great. I I look forward to to seeing how that works out. I'd, I'd love to talk to him and appreciate your assistance. So, isn't it anyway? Here is um. Lord Fairfax settling right across the river from me over in Westmoreland County. We don't say Westmoreland, we say Westmoreland. And that location was just above the Washington family's northern neck plantation. The Washingtons had lived there since 1662 when John Washington established one of Virginia's northernmost settlements at the time, more than 50 miles above the colonized area between the York and James Rivers. So John Washington was a frontiersman. When Lord Fairfax visited in 1735, the head of the family was August, Augustine, how do you say, August, Augustine Washington, or Augustine, I don't know which, Augustine Washington, whose son George was then three years old. Augustine was already involved in a significant way with Alexander Spotswood's policy of westward development. In 1727, the same year as the founding of Fredericksburg, he began producing iron on his lands along Akakeek Run in Stafford County. That's another example. There's an Akakeek in Maryland and an Akakeek in Virginia, right across the river from each other, about 10 miles inland. And I, I went to uh, Boy Scouts in Akakeek, Maryland. Lived there for a little while. Old Indian name, uh, obviously valid for the tribes on both sides of the river. David, that's good. Yeah. I, Roger Taney is the uh, is Chief Justice uh, who settled, who decided, of course, wrote the, uh, the Dred Scott decision. And uh, Francis Scott Key 
um, was uh, the descendant of uh, Maryland um, Protestant elites. At about the same time, another furnace went into operation at the newly established mining community at Fredericksville in Spotsylvania County, south of Fredericksburg. During the next several generations, no family was closer to the Washington family than the Spotswoods. Yet even before their paths joined in the field of iron making, Alexander Spotswood had taken notice of the Washingtons. As governor, he had nominated another John Washington for sheriff of Stafford County in 1717 and did so again in 1718, parentheses when he also nominated Thomas Jefferson, grandfather of the president as sheriff for Henrico County. That's Richmond. The confrontation in Virginia. The arrival of Lord Fairfax signaled a renewal of political warfare in Virginia over the issue of colonization beyond the Appalachian Mountain barrier. Spotswood's return in 1730 as postmaster general for the American colonies must have caused some alarm among his old enemies, but the Lord Proprietor's personal assertion of his Western claims was a more tangible threat to the Tidewater feudalists, who believed they again had a stranglehold on Virginia's future. The danger was clear. If Virginians in the Northern Neck had the freedom to develop new settlements in the West, how could the rest of the colony be restrained? William Byrd II was already worried. In September 1732, he had bestirred himself to journey on horseback to Spotswood's home in Germanna. He planned to try out the role of a genial old acquaintance in order to profile Spotswood's current activities, especially concerning his iron industry. En route to Germanna, Bird may have anticipated an unhappy ending to his plot. He stopped at Tuckahoe, the home of Thomas Randolph, on the James River, about 35 miles northwest of Bird's Westover estate. Heavy rains delayed him there another day. To pass the time, his host and another guest produced a copy of The Beggar's Opera, and they all read the parts aloud. Gay's brilliant satire was obviously a hit on the Virginia frontier, as it had been in London. Byrd noted in his journal of the trip, quote, this was not owing altogether to the wit or humor that sparked it, but to some political reflections that seemed to hit the Walpole ministry. By the time he reached Germana, Byrd had recast himself as an admiring toady so much so that he sustained the part in the record he made in his journal. He arrived in the afternoon at Colonel Spotswood's enchanted castle, the large frame house on a brick foundation which he had built for his wife and children. In the evening, the noble colonel came home from his mines, and the next morning Bird told him that beside the pleasure of paying him a visit, I came to be instructed by so great a master in the mystery of making iron, wherein he had led the way. Spotswood acknowledged that his iron works had inspired other colonies to expand and improve their own production. In the case of Pennsylvania, he noted, quote, they have so few ships to carry their iron to Great Britain that they must be content to make it only for their own use and must be obliged to man manufacture it when they have done. That he hoped he had done the country very great service by setting so good an example that in four furnaces now at work in Virginia circulated a great sum of money for provisions and all other necessities in the adjacent counties, that they took off a great number of hands from planting tobacco. Unquote. Bird learned that Spotswood had opened a new mine 13 miles below Germana, near the present town of Mine Run in Spotsylvania County. He was transporting the ore quote, which was very rich, to a new furnace he had built at Massaponax, below Fredericksburg, about 15 miles to the east. There, Spotswood had perfected America's first air furnace, 
which would enable him, quote, to furnish the whole country with all sorts of cast iron, as cheap and as good as ever came from England, unquote. Just stop and think about the, the impact of that, because this, this is what Graham Lowry has given us in this book. Okay, actual, tangible, real facts to support the theory that we've, we've studied, which is that the British colonial system required that the colonies remain on the uh, tidewater, in the, along where the ports are and along the water where ships could reach them, and that they not be allowed to manufacture their own goods. And the case of making an iron forge or foundry is a direct threat to the British monopoly on manufacturers that would enrich the British, but not enhance the lives of the colonists. So this is, this is I think it's just fascinating to say this is an actual real case in which we can see the momentum for the revolution to be building. Excuse me a second. Roger Tanney's house is still standing, by the way, David. I, I've, you can see pictures of it on the internet. I tried to get there, but the, uh, the person who owns it now um, does not allow anyone to get on the property. Uh, he runs a, a farm. Uh, I think he's run, he, it's either cattle or horses, but the house is still there. It's one of those lovely old antebellum houses with a wraparound porch. And trees all around it's gorgeous you can kindly see it for the from the road but think of all those wealthy catholic families in maryland these are the english catholics the english catholics that had to leave england and they didn't disappear so what became of them interesting they were slaveholders just as big as slaveholders as the protestants don't forget it. That's very important. The idea that Catholicism is superior in some ways, I don't know. You know, they held slaves, lots of them. All right, shut up, John. The anxiety among birds circle rose considerably once Fairfax was in Virginia. The northern neck proprietor waited five months before making his first appearance in the colonial capital at Williamsburg. The delay provided him with ample opportunity to do some profiling of his own. Since Spotswood's removal from the governorship in 1722, corruption in high office had again become the rule in Virginia. Members of the council in 1735, by royal appointment, included William Byrd, John Grimes, and John Carter, the principal heir of the late unlimited King Carter. William Gooch, governor since 1727, had already disposed of approximately 300,000 acres within the Fairfax claim through land grants issued without any authority. Accompanied by his cousin William, Lord Fairfax finally made his way to Williamsburg in October. Titled visitors were rare enough, but his plain clothing apparently caused a great sensation. He stopped to pay his respects to Governor Gooch, who now occupied the magnificent official residence designed by Spotswood. Not long thereafter, pleasantries gave way to business when Lord Fairfax delivered the Privy Council's order of November 29, 1733, to resolve the disputed boundaries of the Fairfax claim. Although the Privy Council had specified that any surveys be directed by commissioners representing both sides, Lord Fairfax offered to leave the matter in the hands of any three commissioners named by the governor so long as they were members of the Virginia Council. 
Such a move by Fairfax was probably designed to convey his confidence that any survey would have to reflect where the rivers actually flowed rather than where others might wish they did. His tactic also put responsibility for initiating any confrontation squarely upon the council. Whatever Fairfax's expectations were, the council immediately showed its hand. Upon receiving the proprietor's offer, Gooch and the gang rushed through their appointments of the survey commissioners. Topping the list was none other than William Byrd, followed by his crone, old crony John Grimes, Walpole's receiver general for Virginia. To present at least a veneer of impartiality, they awarded the third position to John Robinson, an ally of Spotswood. As governor, Spotswood had first nominated Robinson to the council in 1716 during his attempt to reverse Byrd's majority control. In 1720, Spotswood succeeded in appointing Robinson to the council to fill the vacancy resulting from the death of his oldest friend in Virginia, William Cock. Winter had already set in, and there would be no surveys attempted before spring. Fairfax returned to William's home near the Potomac. During the fall, their Washington family neighbors had moved further up the Potomac to establish a new home near Little Hunting Creek. It later became famous as George Washington's Mount Vernon. The move may have been undertaken in conjunction with Lord Fairfax's push for his western claims. Certainly it came at a time when Byrd's circle was nervous about any westward motion. Governor Gooch even paid Fairfax a personal visit that winter to argue that the Northern Neck Grant should be constructed to extend no higher than the falls of the Rappahannock and Potomac Rivers. Under that interpretation, the western boundary of the Fairfax property would run from just above Fredericksburg to a point on the Potomac about 10 miles above Washington, D.C. Gooch had no serious grounds for expecting Fairfax to accept such a proposal, which would have terminated the proprietary well before the Blue Ridge Mountains. But the governor had been sent to roll back the western borders as far as he could manage. His alternative contention was that the limits of the Fairfax grant were the forks of the boundary rivers, especially the forks of the Potomac. The main branches whereof are called Shenandoah and Kohongaratun. Never heard that second one. C-O-H-O-N-G-A-R-O-O-T-O-N. Kohongarutun. Kohongarutun. I don't know. It must be an old Indian name. Strategically, this offer was not much better. A line from the fork of the Rappahannock just west of the falls above Fredericksburg to the junction of the Potomac and Shenandoah would entirely exclude the Shenandoah Valley and all of the proprietary claims to the Piedmont east of the Blue Ridge except at the northern end opposite of Harpers Ferry, Virginia. Since 1688, by royal grant, the northern neck proprietor had claims to the first heads or springs of the Rappahannock and Potomac. Lord Fairfax observed that it was a mystery to him how Gooch could argue the limits to be either their falls or forks. The Kohangarutan, moreover, was plainly the western reaches of the Potomac itself, flowing down from the Allegheny Mountains. Fairfax stated his case to the governor and awaited the survey, which began in 1736. Warm days and spring blossoms generally grace Virginia before the end of March, yet no surveying parties had set out by late April. Gooch and Byrd were stalling in Williamsburg. On April 22nd, Lord Fairfax dispatched his cousin William with instructions, quote, to move the governor for orders that the commissioners begin the survey. The proprietor himself set out two days later, quote, toward the mountains to make his own inspection of the upper Shenandoah and the, quote, Kohan Garutan. He assured the early pioneers of the Shenandoah Valley that he wanted to have the country settled. He would not contest any grants Gooch had issued in the Crown's name prior to 1735, provided they had been surveyed in an honest and equitable manner. Fairfax also informed him that he would not have any poor man quit the place for want of land. Such an unheard-of policy quickly attracted attention, and Fairfax soon learned that a number of, quote, gentlemen of fortune, unquote, were circulating petitions in the valley 
against his claim. Before he could explore the Western Potomac, Fairfax also learned that the colonial government had still done nothing to begin the survey. In the middle of May, he returned to William Fairfax's temporary home, where his cousin informed him that for unanswerable reasons, the commissioners had decided to wait until September as the properest season. The council also threw up roadblocks, delaying until August 11th its approval of instructions. Then Lord Fairfax was asked to sign a paper, binding him to accept the commissioner's findings on all matters concerning the grant. Fairfax was not about to allow Byrd's crew to assume such powers. In a written reply to Gooch, Fairfax noted that the main dispute is what is meant and understood to be the first heads or springs of the two rivers. The proprietor insisted that it seemed most equitable to have the case determined by his majesty in council, before whom the case may be fairly argued on both sides. Fairfax had no objection to a geographic survey of the rivers and their sources, but he declared he would not give any, quote, other or fuller power to any commissioners. The issue was now fully joined. Byrd's forces were still committed to stopping westward development, even if that meant cheating a lord proprietor out of his royal grant. A sycophant like Byrd would only have undertaken such high-handed measures against a British lord if he were assured of powerful support from the Walpole government. Such assurance clearly extended to Governor Gooch and the council as a whole. They unanimously replied to Fairfax's refusal to sign over complete jurisdiction by declaring that since his proposal, quote, gave no authority to mark and settle the boundaries, it ought not to be accepted or executed by His Majesty's commissioners. The forces behind William Byrd had plainly stated their position. They had no interest in any survey to determine the actual extent of the Fairfax grant. They simply wanted to prevent its reaching beyond the mountains. To force a survey, Fairfax now named his own commissioners, headed by William Fairfax. On September 25, 1736, both sides met at Fredericksburg to hammer out terms for proceeding. Byrd still tried to claim authority to determine the northern net boundaries, but finally conceded, quote, to drive the nail that would go, unquote, when the Fairfax commissioners again refused. It was agreed that the surveys of both the Rappahannock and Potomac Rivers would begin on September 29th. Both sides were empowered, empowered only to make a fact-finding report, and the Potomac surveyors were directed to trace its source beyond the junction with the Shenandoah to its first head, or spring. Against his opposition in Virginia, Lord Fairfax had attained an important victory. His primary objective at this stage was to obtain a legal survey of the sources of the Boundary Rivers, regardless of who the commissioners were. The most telling evidence would be the natural dictates of the rivers themselves, and those would be ascertained by licensed surveyors, not by commissioners. In Virginia, surveyors had to be certified for competence by the College of William and Mary. Many of them had been trained and licensed during the governorship of Alexander Spotswood, the leading geometer and mathematician in the colony. Even the commissioners for the king had to select a number of surveyors who were associated with Spotswood. For the Potomac survey, they named Robert Brook, one of Spotswood's, quote, Knights of the Golden Horseshoe, unquote. The Rapidan, the south branch of the Rappahannock, was strictly Spotswood territory. To determine whether the Rapidan could, Rapidan could claim the head spring, the surveyors named by the colony were John Graham and George Hume. Graham was Spotswood's cousin, an astronomer, whom Spotswood had left in charge of his ironworks at Germana during his absence in London. George Hume was the protege of Spotswood, who had been the surveyor for the founding of Fredericksburg in 1727. On October the 2nd, William Fairfax, Byrd, and the other commissioners spent the night at Spotswood's Germana home, where the former governor regaled them with war stories from the days when he had fought in Europe. The Rappahannock survey went swiftly enough, but the team followed the Upper Potomac repeatedly haggled, haggled, 
following the Upper Potomac, repeatedly haggled and broke down over various difficulties along the way. Lord Fairfax complained that the colony's commissioners were the cause of the delay. Not until the summer of 1737 did they meet in Williamsburg to approve a map based on the surveys. Bird's group still insisted on labeling the Potomac west of the Shenandoah the Kohan Garutan, thus leaving three million acres in dispute. Fairfax concluded, concluded he would have to return to London to break the stalemate. He decided not to submit his own commissioner's report to the governor and very privately embarked on a ship in the Rappahannock bound for England. He took with him a map prepared for the res from the results of his own surveyor's work. On matters of geography, it differed only slightly from the one produced by Birds' group. What remained was the interpretation of the origins of the boundary rivers of the Fairfax Grant, and that was a political question. The final decision remained in the hands of King George II. Lord Fairfax's departure put the development of the Shenandoah Valley on hold. Neither Fairfax nor the Virginia Council would issue grants while their authority remained in dispute, pending a ruling on the Potomac question. At the same time, however, a series of moves occurred in Virginia which helped to shape a much larger outcome. One was the consolidation of an alliance between the Fairfax and Washington families, of major significance to the future course of American independence. Following Augustine Washington's move to the, now I said it three ways, Augustine, Augustine, yeah, Augustine, that's what I want to say. Sorry, sometimes I get up in my head about this. Following Augustine Washington's move to his new Potomac home, which became Mount Vernon, William Fairfax acquired a tract immediately below it in 1736 on this neighboring estate, which he named Belvoir. William built a beautiful brick mansion overlooking the Potomac River. Well, Belvoir, of course, that's French beautiful view, right? Fort Belvoir is the center of George Webb's reporting on the... Uh, The V. The construction was completed in 1741. About 350 yards up the river, closer to the Washington estate, William Fairfax built his customs office, which he named, quote, the White House. In 1743, his daughter Anne married Lawrence Washington, Augustine's 25 year old son who took charge of his younger brother George when their father died that same year. Much later, the British Navy paid its own perverse tribute to the importance of the Fairfax-Washington connection. During the War of 1812, the British expressed their frustrations over their failure to destroy the United States by pillaging the nation's capital designed under George Washington's supervision. En route to burning the White House in 1814, the British squadron sailing up the Potomac paused within shooting range of Belvoir. Training their guns on the mansion, British warships leveled it to the ground. At less expense, British soldiers had done the same to John Winthrop's house in Boston during the American Revolution. There was another significant move in Virginia after Lord Thomas Fairfax departed for London in 1737. It underscored the connection to Spotswood without whom neither the Fairfaxes nor the Washingtons could have contributed to founding a new nation. In 1738, Augustine Washington acquired a tract of land along the northern bank of the Rappahannock River. With the Fairfax claim yet unresolved, his, he moved his family again in 1739 to a new home across the river from Fredericksburg. The loco location was closer to his own iron mining operations and to Spotswoods as well. Spotswood's headquarters as America's postmaster general were just a few miles downstream at New Post. Not far above Fredericksburg was Spotswood's home at Germana. In these surroundings, 
George Washington grew to age fifteen, with a republic still to win. That's a lovely story. Um, you know, you see, you hear these facts told in different order, in different ways, by different people. Um, and I, you know, being a, a, a person, a graduate of William and Mary, a, a lifelong resident along the Potomac, on, sometimes in Virginia and sometimes mostly in Maryland, I, uh, I appreciate this book very, very much. And I appreciate each of you for helping me uh, sustain this effort uh, to try to provide people with uh, an alternate history that makes more sense that we can use in analyzing the problems of today. Thanks very much. Good night. Good afternoon.